I've called the seminar Raw, which is researching women in the 15th century, um, partly because I wanted to do a bit of a balance where, you know, I'll sort of tell you all a little bit about my book and the women in the book and the research that I've done um, and the sort of general historical information, um, but also put a little bit in there about, you know, how I sort of went about researching these women um, and sort of general bits of information about researching women in the medieval period that you might be able to use sort of in your classes or that you can pass on to students. Um, so hopefully we'll kind of pick that up um, as we go through as well. Um, if I click, there we go. Um, so yeah, this is my book, Royal Witches. Um, it came out two years ago this month. Um, so as you say, perfect in time for Halloween. Um, the book is based around four women. Um, who were all part of the English royal family in the 15th century, so that's the 1400s, um, and they're all on screen there. So you've got Joan of Navarre, Eleanor Cobham, Jaquette of Luxembourg, and Elizabeth Woodville. Um, and I would hasten to add, I'm not trying to suggest that Jaquette of Luxembourg was actually a mermaid. Um, unfortunately, there's no surviving picture of her, um, and her sort of Luxembourg family claimed descent from a mythical mermaid um, who's in the picture there, so that's, that's her image there. Um, but all four of these women, as I said, were all in the 15th century. None of them were born into the English royal family. They all married in. Um, and the cases against them that we're going to explore happens in about a 70 year period. So the first um, accusations are against Joan of Navarre, and that's in 1419. And the last case is against Elizabeth Woodville um, and the sort of the last point of the accusations against her are about 1486. Um, so that's the kind of time span. Um, and what's important to remember as well is that all of these women knew each other, lived each other, uh, lived with each other, interacted with each other over their time. Um, so Joan of Navarre married into the royal family. She married Henry IV of England. Um, her, she had various stepchildren through her marriage with him, uh, and two of these stepchildren went on to marry Eleanor Cobham and Jacquette of Luxembourg, so they were all linked through marriage that way. Um, and then Elizabeth Woodville was Jacquette of Luxembourg's daughter, um, and so obviously related to Jacquette that way, um, but again had, had ties with Eleanor, not so much Joan, El Elizabeth's born around the time that Joan dies, um, but she certainly would have known Eleanor when she was a child. So. The cases happen in a short period to women who all knew each other, who were all part of the same family. And that's quite important to remember, really, because it shows just how linked all of the cases are. Um, you know, these weren't just random things that happened over a really long period of time. You know, these happen in quite short succession. Um, so to start off with, I thought I'd just take a brief look um, about magic in the medieval period, um, because obviously not everyone knows too much about it. Um, and sort of understanding what people believed is really important to understanding the accusations that happened against the women. Um, so I've done just a bit of a brief summary here. Um, so the first thing that's quite important, particularly when the book is called Royal Witches, is that actually at this time, there wasn't really a word for witch. Um, so at the start of the century, the concept of a witch and witchcraft didn't exist. You couldn't look at someone and say, yes, they're a witch because they do X, Y, and Z, or they look like this and they do that. Um, the word only really develops sort of right towards the end of the century. Um, and it's at the end of the century that you start to get these witch hunting manuals. So one of the most famous ones is called the Malleus Maleficarum, which means the hammer of witches. And this was written by a German man. And he's the one who sort of sat down and he's the one who really pointed the finger at women being witches. Um, he believed it was overwhelmingly women who, who were witches and performed witchcraft, um, particularly um, immoral women. So women who were on the edges of society, women who had engaged in adultery or had been mistresses. So, you know, these sort of impious women who weren't very morally good were more likely to engage in witchcraft. And as you go into the Tudor period, his his hammer of witches becomes kind of one of the main guides that informs what people believe witches are. But that only comes out actually a few years after the last case in the book. So his ideas hadn't even gotten out in the world when this was over. Um, so if people didn't know about the concept of a witch, then what did they know? Um, well, 
what they did know is that magic is actually quite difficult to define. Um, in this period, you sort of have, you know, magic, religion and science. And to medieval minds, they were quite separate things. But when we're looking back at the past, they can actually seem to be quite blurred and you can have aspects of one in another. And in sometimes it's viewed as a good thing and sometimes it's viewed as a bad thing. So one example would be astrology. So although obviously some people today do still believe in astrology, a lot of people just think that it's something that's a bit of fun or a bit of nonsense. You know, why, why would you being a Pisces make any bearing on your life and things like that? But actually in the medieval period, a lot of people believed it was a solid science. Um, and this was so much so that um, it was believed that the stars and the planets could affect your body. And because of this, uh, doctors were expected to know astrology because the way you would treat a patient would vary depending on the sort of current position of the stars and planets and how that related to that patient. Um, so in the bottom right picture on the screen there, that's actually an image from um, a medical handbook from the very late 14th century. Um, and you can see you've got a person there and it's a diagram showing how the different signs of the zodiac correspond to different parts of the body. And the text that are in the four corners is explaining how those signs relate to the different humours. Um, and in medieval uh, medicine, it was believed that you had these humours in your body um, that sort of affected your health and your behaviour. And if you had too much of one particular humour, it could make you sick or it could make you sad. And so you would do different treatments based on that. So, you know, if it, if it was thought you were having too much blood, that's why you would sort of blood let people and things like that. And so there's an example of how astrology that we might think could be sort of magical or kooky was actually a science um, but at the same time people um, people didn't just blindly believe things you know you kind of have this idea of the sort of ignorant medieval period and they believed wacky things but they did look at things logically and with a scientific mind and not everybody believed that astrology was a science. Um, a lot of religious people said that it went against sort of the teachings of the Bible, um, the idea that, you know, it's God who controls your life, not the stars. Um, and it also sort of goes against the idea of free will. If you have the idea that you should do a battle under a certain celestial alignment, then that's kind of affecting the idea that God's given you free will and is sort of letting you control your own destiny, is passing it off. Um, and also people like they do today would point to twins and say, well, well, these two twins you know they were born at the exact same time but they've led completely different lives so how can astrology have a bearing on that um and that is important sort of in the realm of magic as well um again we have this idea of the early modern witch hunts and things like the salem witch trials of this idea that there was this hysteria and people would point fingers left right and center and everybody would go crazy certainly in the medieval period this isn't the case you know ideas of magic and witchcraft are only just developing and so people are looking at it quite critically and although people would might believe that magic was real and people could wield magic they didn't blindly believe as soon as someone's called a witch that they're a witch they would still assess the evidence and so you can see that in different aspects of life another thing that's quite interesting is the religious aspect um, and again how religion could kind of look like magic to us today. Um, so um, the picture on the top left that I've got there, um, it's a sort of piece of parchment um, that, that was sort of known as a girdle and it's filled with religious imagery, um, particularly related to Mary, but you've got sort of things to do with the life of Jesus on there as well. Like you've got the cross and the nails and things like that. And this was something that was used by medieval noblewomen. Um, it was quite popular for different saintly relics or girdles like this, or sort of items with the religious imagery to be used when a woman was giving birth and it would be placed over her belly and it would be a way to try and sort of ask the saints ask Mary ask God to intercede with this pregnant woman as she's giving birth to keep her safe to keep the baby safe to sort of ease labor pains make sure everything goes okay um, but you can kind of see how in a way that's kind of a bit magical you know you're you're imbuing this object with this magical power that it's going to help you give birth safely um, and you know that kind of thing did overlap a lot so sometimes crusaders or soldiers might have a sword where they engraved the name of Jesus or a prayer on it 
with the hope that it would protect them in battle. But at the same time, you would have kings have chalices with supposed unicorn horns, which are probably sort of narwhal horns and things like that. But, you know, what they believed were unicorn horns and they believed that unicorn horn, if you drank from a chalice with a unicorn horn in, then it would um, negate any poison. So it was a way to stop you being poisoned. And obviously that's sort of a more magical incantation. And so you sort of do have quite a bit of overlap um, with the religious, the magic and the science. And that sort of only extends during this period, particularly with magic and science, where people are sort of exploring avenues of science like alchemy, you know, trying to turn metals into gold as a way to pay your soldiers. It's a very scientific endeavor. And, you know, using these astrological charts as a doctor to treat your patients. But more and more, these start to become associated with magic. Um, and, you know, the idea that spells had to be done under certain phases of the moon or certain phases of planets. And so if you've got an astrological chart for a scientific purpose, suddenly it can be uh, used as evidence that you're actually using it for magic. You know, how can you prove that this chart you've made is to see if an important battle is going to happen or if you're trying to cause magical harm with it? Um, and again, that sort of becomes quite important as this period goes on. And the last thing just to mention really is the idea, particularly in this period, of different types of gendered magic. Um, so the two bits that are sort of most important in my book are necromancy and love magic. So necromancy was also known as negromancy, so black magic at the time. Um, but it starts to become this idea that rather at the start of the period, it's this general sort of evil, malign magic idea. But you soon get this idea that necromancy is this very specific type of magic where you call the spirits of the dead and they can maybe tell the future for you. They can give you information about hidden treasure that you can try and find um, or they can carry out nefarious deeds for you. Um, and this is seen as a really evil type of magic. You know, to be summoning the spirits of the dead is a really evil, nefarious type of magic. But it's also very skilled. So there isn't this idea that anybody anywhere can do necromancy. You know, the uneducated peasant woman in her village is not going to be able to do this. You have to be really intelligent, really learned to do it. And obviously in this period, the only people with that type of education that would be able to do that is men, because even royal women who were, who were very well educated, uh, you know, for their gender, none of them went to university, you know, they would have been taught languages and how to read and write, but they wouldn't be taught these kinds of skills that you would need and they wouldn't have access to the books that you would need to learn them. Whereas monks at universities or in big sort of monasteries with huge libraries, they're going to have access to these resources. So there's really this idea that it's only men who can take part in necromancy. And again, that's really important because if you're trying to accuse a woman of witchcraft, and you're trying to say that she's done some really evil magic, you're going to need some men on board as accomplices because it just wouldn't be believed that a woman would be capable of doing that. So if a woman can't do necromancy, what can she do? Uh, well, there's this idea of love magic and this only really starts to develop around the middle of the century going onwards. Um, and certainly in England, I would argue, is actually quite influenced by the case of Eleanor Cobham, um, who we'll come to later. But this is the idea that women um, are much more emotional creatures than men. They're a lot more subject to their emotions and to their whims. They can't control themselves as much as men. And so they're much more likely to do magic along the forms of emotional lines and this is obviously going to end up being love magic uh, because women just want to get married and they want to have babies and so they're going to use love magic to try and make a man fall in love with them um, or possibly if a man has scorned them if he's wronged them they might use magic against him as a bit of revenge um, but there's also this idea of sort of using magic to help with fertility issues. Um, and you might go, um, as in the past, you might have gone to a sort of local herbalist or, you know, sort of medicine person um, for herbs to help with your fertility. This sort of starts to move over towards this idea of a female witch who might be able to provide potions for you to help you conceive. Um, and so again, that, that really becomes quite important sort of towards the latter half of the century in these political um, accusations, uh, which again, we'll come to a bit later. So um, 
I do want to focus mostly just on the cases themselves as we don't have too much time, um, but I'll give you a very brief um, background to each woman before we get into the cases. Um, and there's a great bit of marketing, I'd say if you want to know more then buy my book. <laughs> um, but we'll start off with Joan of Navarre, she's the first case in the book. Um, so she was born around 1370, so just the previous century, and she was probably born in France. Now her father was Charles II of Navarre, so he was King of Navarre. Um, so I'm not sure if you can see my mouse on the screen, but that's this kingdom in red, sort of right in the top right bit of Spain on the border with um, France. Now, although he was King of Navarre, he had actually inherited a lot of land in modern day France from his parents, um, particularly a lot of land up there in Normandy. Now, at this time, as you can see from the map, uh, the Kingdom of France itself is actually quite a small portion of what we would call modern day France. And there was a whole load of independent territories um, that were sort of run by various dukes or counts um, or at various points were fought over between the French and the English. So the English would have some territory. Um, and so this means that a lot of these independent dukes of these territories um, are quite vulnerable because a lot of them own land both in England and France. And so they kind of have this dual loyalty between the two thrones and they often get caught in the middle. Um, and Charles is very much a case of this. Um, he sort of tries to play off both the sides from each other, but it doesn't work out for him very well. And he loses a lot of his land in France and he's forced to go back to Navarre. And so he decides he needs a political alliance to try and help defend him against these two big powers. And a really obvious choice is Brittany over here. It's bordering a lot of his lands in a sort of Normandy area in northern France. Uh, Brittany is also being caught in a similar situation um, because the Duke of Brittany had allied himself with the English king. He'd married one of the English king's daughters. Um, but again, he owed um, loyalty to the French throne as well. So the two rulers sort of team up together and it's decided that Joan, uh, Charles's daughter, is going to get married to the Duke of Brittany to sort of seal this alliance. Um, now, this was actually the Duke's third uh, marriage. He hadn't managed to have any children so far. And um, Joan was about 16 years old at the time and her husband was 30 years older than her. So very much political marriage. Um, but on, on his terms, it was a very successful marriage um, because Joan fulfilled her duty and and finally gave him a male heir. And in total, over the period of about 10 years, Joan gives birth to nine children. So although she's Duchess of Brittany and could theoretically have quite a bit of power in that role, actually she was pregnant for pretty much the entirety of their marriage. And so in reality, she probably wasn't able to hold too much political influence. Um, but what, what's really important is in 1399, two big events happen, uh, only within a few weeks of each other, really. Uh, the first is that her husband, John, dies. So she's become a widow with lots of young children, and she's still quite young herself. She's only sort of in her late 20s, early 30s at this time. And the other important thing is a man called Henry IV becomes king in England. Um, so he had actually overthrown his cousin, Richard II, and taken the throne for himself. Now, he was a distant relative um, of Jones. They were sort of cousins a couple of times removed, and they'd already met a few times. Um, and very quickly, the two start to correspond with each other. And we actually have um, sort of at least one letter that survives between the two that sort of suggests that there's a bit of a romantic twist going on in their relationship. So within a couple of years, uh, the couple decided to get married. Um, and this is very much a kind of love marriage, really, because there's not really any political things to gain for Henry. Um, he doesn't really get any land or power from Joan, um, from her sort of territories in, in Brittany or anything like that. Um, actually, Brittany is quite disliked in England. So if anything, it's just going to irritate people to sort of have this alliance there. Um, but he's already got children. He'd already been married before, so he didn't need an heir to the throne. So he was able to afford to have a marriage that he wanted rather than necessarily a political one. Um, so Joan comes over to England at the start of 1403 and she gets married to Henry and she has her coronation. So she's made Queen of England. So this is a really great rise for Joan. You know, although she was princess and she'd been a duchess, she was now Queen of England, which was a really important role. 
And she was also rewarded a lot by Henry for this. Um, so he gave her a huge dower, which was basically the income given to a queen to sort of sustain herself every year. And he gave her the uh, 10,000 marks a year, which was the largest dower of any queen up to that point. And that was the equivalent of sort of six and a half thousand pounds or so, um, which was a tenth of the entire income of the English crown at that time. So it was a really huge chunk of money, really significant amount. Um, so Joan's done really well for herself. Um, so she's married for about 10 years um, before Henry IV dies. And after he dies, she decides that she's going to stay in England. And she has a very lovely relationship with her stepchildren and her stepson, who's the new Henry V. She's treated really well by him. He writes letters to her where he calls her, her most, his most dear mother. Um, he gives her some of his castles to use when he's away. He gives her lots of gifts. Um, so she's having a really great time. But a few years later in 1419, uh, the goods of her personal confessor, who's a man called Friar Randolph, were seized. And when you look at this list of items that were seized, it soon becomes really clear that actually a lot of these items belong to Joan. You know, they're pieces of gold and silver and jewels and sumptuous clothing and bedding that just a, a friar wouldn't have. They, they clearly belong to Joan. And then the next month, Friar Randolph comes in front of Parliament and he scandalously accuses Joan of using witchcraft to try and kill the king, which is obviously a very serious accusation. It's treason to kill the king and especially to be doing so with witchcraft is very scandalous for the time. So Joan is arrested. Uh, she's placed under house arrest and is moved between a variety of castles um, for the next few months. But March the following year, she gets sent to Leeds Castle in Kent and she's held there for over two years in imprisonment. Now, she never has a formal trial. Um, no formal charges are sort of brought and assessed and judged against her. She's never found guilty or innocent. And a lot of this comes down to the fact that these were clearly very political accusations. Um, it wasn't believed that Joan had actually tried to kill the king. Um, so at this time, Henry V had restarted his wars against uh, the English wars against France. Um, and he sort of had this huge victory at the Battle of Agincourt in 1415. And since then, he'd sort of been going from strength to strength. And he was in a position where he seemed like he was really close to winning the French throne for himself because the English had been claiming for sort of about not quite 100 years but around that that they had the right to the throne and he was winning so many battles the French king was very weak because he was suffering from mental illnesses and so it seemed like he was going to be able to claim this for himself but war is the most expensive thing a monarch can do and he had no money left and so suddenly Joan's huge income that she had been given all those years ago was looking really, uh, really appetizing. And so by accusing her of witchcraft and imprisoning her, the crown was able to seize all of her money, all of her lands, all of her income, and they were able to use it for themselves, thus being able to help with these wars and helping uh, Henry get married to his new wife and then give her an income as well. The reason that they never put her on trial was both to help themselves and to help Joan. So as I said before, you know, up to that point, Henry had had a really good relationship with Joan. And so although he was willing to be cruel enough to do these accusations against her to seize her things, he didn't actually want her to suffer from the effects of being accused of treason and being found a witch, because obviously these are sort of crimes that you could be executed for. So by not putting her on trial, you don't risk her being found guilty and having these marks against her name. Um, but at the same time, if she was put on trial and found innocent, then the Crown would have to return everything to her and they'd also have to give her compensation for all the time that they had it in their control so this isn't good for the crown either so by having her accused and imprisoned but not putting her on trial it meant that they could use all of her lands and money but Joan was protected and they could kind of resolve things whenever they wanted to uh, now, the resolution actually came about with the death of Henry V. Um, he became quite ill when he was on one of his campaigns, and soon it became clear he was dying. And he actually gathered his lords at Parliament and sort of set Joan free, basically. And there's a very sort of emotive line where he says, you know, that she should be restored, lest her be a charge upon our conscience. So you can really get this feeling that he is a man who is dying and he's suddenly feeling terribly guilty about the way that he's treated his stepmother and he wants to make sure that she's okay before he dies. Um, and he also sort of skips over what the accusations exactly were because he doesn't actually say 
why she was arrested. He just says, for causes as you know. So again, he's kind of trying to downplay the accusations against her so that they don't follow her after her restitution. Now, luckily for Joan, she does get fully restored. She does get her lands and money returned to her. And remarkably, she still decides to stay in England after this. And she lives out the rest of her life very peaceably in the kingdom, moving between various palaces, going on various pilgrimages. Um, sort of as you go into the 1430s, she sells off a lot of her goods or sort of gives it away to other family members and lives a bit more of a simple life. Um, and in 1437, when she died, she was buried in Canterbury Cathedral beside her husband, Henry IV, with full honours afforded to a queen. So it really shows that she managed to come back even after these accusations and she wasn't impacted by them. Um, I thought I would just pause very briefly to have a, a quick look at just a couple of sources. Um, as I said, you know, sort of looking on the more learning side of it. Um, and I know that, you know, we always love giving sources to students to have a look at. Um, and I just thought it was very interesting to have a look at a couple of the sources surrounding the accusations against Joan, um, because they're actually surprisingly patchy. Uh, you have to do quite a bit of guesswork and piecing together to actually understand what she was accused of. So if you look at the first quote on the left, this is the quote sort of in the parliamentary records. And this is the accusations that the friar made against Joan. And he says, Joan, Queen of England, has plotted and schemed for the death and destruction of our said Lord the King in the most evil and terrible manner imaginable which is really emotive language, but it's also very vague. What is the most evil and terrible manner imaginable? How do you kill someone in that way? They're not actually saying that she's used witchcraft to try and do it. And part of that is probably, as I said, they didn't necessarily have the language to talk about it. But it's also part of this political idea around the accusations that they're not quite saying exactly what it is she's accused of. She's tried to kill the king and that's all you need to know. And the thing that's quite interesting is that a lot of the chronicles around this time are very vague as well. So several of the chronicles don't actually even mention at all that Joan was arrested. Uh, one of them, the Brute Chronicle, which you can see on the right there, is again quite vague. It does mention it, but it's very vague. It says that Queen Joan, who was Henry IV's wife, was arrested by John, Duke of Bedford, then Lieutenant of England, and sent to the Castle of Leeds and Kent. And that's all it says. And it doesn't say why she's arrested, which again is very interesting. And it's only when you look at another chronicle, the Chronicle of London, that you get this idea that it was magic. So it says that um, Friar Randolph, at the exciting of the foresaid queen, by sorcery and by negromancy sought to destroy the king. So it's only here that you finally get that thing, that, that idea that it was magic that she was trying to use. Um, but this is the case of where bringing together lots of different sources can really add richness um, to a story. Um, and these sources really illustrate the idea that it was political accusations and that they were probably not really believed by people at the time. And the government really didn't do much to try and make the accusations look convincing. They didn't try to put her on trial. They didn't try to gather all this evidence and say she did witchcraft by doing this and this and this. They just say, oh, yes, she tried to kill the king and words kind of spreading. But, you know, if people at the time really believed that the Queen of England had tried to kill the king, this is going to be huge news. Every chronicle is going to be talking about it. They're going to have all of the details. So the fact that half of them don't mention it and the ones that do don't really mention what the charges are and you only get one or two that actually mention the magic, it really puts across that idea that the people writing it don't believe it's real because otherwise they'd seize upon it a bit more. So I just thought that's quite an interesting thing to look at there. Uh, so moving on quickly to our second woman, Eleanor Cobham. Um, she is a bit more of a lower class woman than uh, Joan. So Joan was obviously born into royalty and nobility. Uh, Eleanor Cobham was the daughter of a knight, uh, Lord Reginald Cobble, uh, Cobham, sorry, and born around 1400, so about 30 years or so after Joan. Um, she had some notable ancestors, um, such as a Knight of the Garter from the previous century, um, and some people who'd been quite high up uh, in government, but sort of her family had slid down the rungs of nobility somewhat. So in the grand scheme of the whole country, she was quite high up, but in terms of the royal sphere and the royal court, she was a much lower class woman. 
Um, however, um, I have included this lovely quote, quote from one of the uh, chroniclers at the time, who described her as a very noble lady of great descent. She was beautiful and marvelously kind. And this is quite important, I think, because a lot of the contemporary scholarship about Eleanor has been uh, marred by the later accusations against her and the later writings against her. So after her ac the accusations of witchcraft against her, you have all of these people writing about how she deserved this downfall. She was greedy. Um, she was too high up. She was very haughty and she thought that she was better than everybody else. And historians subsequently have really run with this and said, you know, she she irritated people and people didn't like her because of this. But actually, when I was researching her, the few sources that talk about her before the accusations, so when they don't have that to mar them, are all very positive. And this is one example saying how noble she was, how beautiful and kind she was. And I think, again, that's quite interesting and important when we're talking about researching this period is that, you know, propaganda can carry through centuries. And it's always important to go to the source of these claims about people's personalities and how they acted and see does the contemporary accounts actually back this up? Because in Eleanor's case, I don't think that it does. Um, but the important thing in Eleanor's life is in 1428, she man, uh, marries Humphrey, Duke of Gloucester, who was Joan's uh, stepson. He was one of the princes of England. He was Henry V's brother. And the two had been having a relationship. Um, she'd been his mistress prior to this um, and they eventually married. So again, a bit like Joan and Henry, it's another love marriage that's happened here. Because um, this is quite a surprising marriage. You know, uh, Eleanor was a lot lower class than Humphrey and it isn't a match that you would expect a prince to make. Um, you know, if he was going to marry a woman from his own kingdom, it was going to be a noble lady, you know, the daughter of an earl, the daughter of a duke, something like that, not the daughter of a knight. So it's quite a surprising marriage that happens there. Um, and 1431, she was admitted to the Fraternity of St Albans, and that's where you get this picture here, uh, which is the only surviving contemporary image of Eleanor, Eleanor uh, is from the Book of Benefactors of that abbey, so that's Eleanor and Humphrey there um, together. So Eleanor and Humphrey got married in 1428 and they'd had, you know, a good sort of decade or so of a happy marriage together. Um, but Humphrey had a lot of political enemies at court and he'd become a bit of a nuisance um, and quite an inconvenience. He was following a sort of old lines of thinking and the new people at court wanted to stop the war with France. They wanted peace so that they could build up the economy, uh, start trade again and have all of those other benefits. Uh, but Humphrey wanted to continue the wars and he had a lot of influence over Henry VI because he was his uncle um, and so Henry VI really loved Humphrey and he really loved Eleanor and so he would listen to him uh, in, in lots of acts um, of his government because he was still quite young, a young king himself, he was only in his teens and so the people at court decided that they needed to get rid of Humphrey um, so that they could have the only attention of Henry VI and he would do everything that they wanted him to do but by this time all of Henry's brothers had died and so he was the heir to the throne because Henry VI as I said he was only a teenager he wasn't married he didn't have any children so if he were to die then Humphrey would become king of England and Eleanor would become queen so you can't just attack the heir to the throne and get rid of him so they needed to do quite a sneaky plot and this is where Eleanor comes in, because in this period, reputation was intertwined. So if one of your family members committed treason or did some really terrible crime, then your own reputation uh, comes under fire as a result. And so if they could attack Eleanor and ruin her reputation, then that would then call Humphrey's own reputation uh, sort of under question. And it might separate him from Henry VI. So in 1441, uh, you have a man called Thomas Subble, who was Eleanor's physician, was sent to the Tower of London. And there's no information given as to why he was sent there. There's just a sort of arrest warrant saying, bring him to the Tower. And then later that month, a couple of weeks later, another man called Roger Bolingbroke, who was again sort of part of Eleanor and Humphrey's household, was put on display at St Paul's Cross. And he was put on stage with loads of um, instruments of magic and necromancy. <clears throat> and he gives this speech about how he's been using evil magic and he's admitting to these crimes against him that he's been doing something really nefarious. Now, once these two events happen, Eleanor senses that something bad is happening. And so she flees to sanctuary for the protection of the church. And this turns out to be quite a wise move because not long afterwards, 
uh, this man, Roger Bolingbroke, accuses her of wanting to know if she would come to any higher degree and estate than that she was in. So again, breaking down that language, this kind of, it's quite a flowery accusation. But basically what he's saying is that she's hired him to make astrological charts to predict her future, to see if she will rise up any higher in life than she already is. Now, she was already married to a prince of England. There's not really much higher she can get. The only higher she can get is if she became queen. And she would only become queen if Henry VI died and her husband became king. So suddenly she's basically asking, is the king going to die so that I can become queen? Now, as you can see, this is really bordering on sort of treason here. She's not necessarily actively asking for the death of the king, but she's causing the suggestion around his health. Um, and it's very easy to then make treason accusations out of that. <coughs> so after this, um, several other members of her household also confess to having been hired by her to use witchcraft. Uh, so John Holm, who's her chaplain and the couple secretary, also admits to it. And you also interestingly have a woman accused as well, a woman called Marjorie Jordemain, who is known as the Witch of Eye Next Westminster. And she had actually been accused of witchcraft about a decade earlier, but she'd been let off with a warning. Um, it was viewed as a matter for the church. She'd obviously not done anything too seriously. And so they'd returned her to her husband and said, as long as you don't do anything again, then you're fine, we'll, we'll let you off the hook. But she's now being accused again of using witchcraft and aiding Eleanor. So as a result of this, Eleanor is brought before a panel of bishops. So she had fled to sanctuary, which meant that she couldn't be, um, she couldn't be put on trial by the secular courts. So all of her accomplices were put on trial by the secular courts, uh, overseen by lords of the land, and they were put on trial for treason. Uh, but because Eleanor was in sanctuary, this couldn't happen. However, witchcraft, as I said, was viewed as a matter of the church at the time. And so although she was in sanctuary, she could be tried by church courts. So she's brought before this panel of bishops and they question her and bring in all of these witnesses that say that she's, she's done these crimes. Now, Eleanor very cleverly tries to spin the crimes um, to lesser charges. So she recognizes that she can't just outright deny all of these accusations when they've got loads of witnesses against her. So instead she says, that she wasn't doing treasonous magic, she was instead doing love magic. So they have these figurines that they say is her uh, a sort of figurine of the king that she's used to try and cause harm to. And she's saying, oh no, no, uh, that's me and my husband. I was trying to make him fall in love with me so that he would marry me. And then she said that she'd gone to Marjorie for love potions to help them conceive a child because they'd never had children. So she's saying, OK, I, I did some magic, but it was only love magic. I was just trying to have a baby. I certainly wasn't trying to kill the king. So she's really trying to downplay these accusations. Now, unfortunately, it doesn't go her way because her enemies are really out to get her. So her accomplices are all found guilty and most of them are executed for treason. Uh, Marjorie Jordemain was actually burnt at the stake. Um, although we have this image of witches being burnt at the stake, in England, certainly in the early modern period, most witches uh, were hanged rather than burnt. Um, but the reason that Marjorie was burnt was she was viewed as a relapsed heretic because she'd already been told by the church not to do it again and she'd now done it. She was seen as a heretic rather than necessarily a witch and heretics were burnt at the stake. So she was burnt at the stake and several other of the accomplices were executed or died in prison. Um, Eleanor, however, um, has a different punishment. So because she said that she's used love magic to try and make Humphrey fall in love with her, the church view this as a form of coercion. So Humphrey wasn't in his right mind when he married her. And coercion was one of the few uh, reasons during the medieval period that you could have a marriage annulled. Uh, so basically like a divorce, um, but it's kind of saying that the marriage was never legal in the first place. So they annul her marriage to Humphrey and she's forced to do three different penances in November, three different weeks, uh, sorry, three different market days across the course of a week or so. Uh, she has to walk uh, through the busy streets of London, making an offering at various churches uh, with a taper in her hand. Um, and this is a really humiliating penance, um, particularly for a noble woman to do. It's a very unusual punishment for a woman of her class. You know, it was maybe lower class women who might have done adultery uh, would have had this kind of punishment, but certainly not a woman of Eleanor's status. So this is really designed to humiliate her and, and sort of make everybody in the kingdom know of her crimes. <coughs> 
so after this the question comes of what to do with her um, because they have decided that they're not going to execute her and the reason for this is probably the intervention of Henry VI um, although it seems very much so that he had been made to believe that Eleanor really had tried to harm him he still loved her you know she was his aunt he'd grown up with her and, and really cared for her so he didn't want to see her executed so instead it seems to have been decided that she is to be sent for life in prison so she's sent away from London at the start of the following year and uh, is moved to various castles in remote locations. She goes to the Isle of Wight and eventually she gets sent to um, Wales and the castle that you can see on the screen here. And she stays there for the last few years of her life and she dies in 1452, never having been released, never having her name cleared and never seeing her husband again. And actually these accusations against her worked completely because Humphrey's reputation was destroyed by these accusations against Eleanor. Henry VI didn't trust him anymore. He kicked him out of the court. He wasn't really allowed to have any influence in politics anymore. And he really loses his position because he's placed under such suspicion from Eleanor. So this was a really successful case um, of witchcraft. Um, so we finally sort of move on to our last two women who I've grouped together, partially because they're mother and daughter, um, partially because the accusations against them are tied together. So we have Jaquette of Luxembourg, who was born about 1415 um, and she was sort of part of this noble family um, of the rulers of Luxembourg um, and she was also descended from the, um, the French monarchs as well so she had royal blood in her veins. Uh, she married as a young teenager like Joan did uh, into the royal family. She married John Duke of Bedford who was Humphrey's brother um, and another one of Joan's stepsons in 1433. Um, and again, John was a lot older than her, again, about 30 years or so older than her. Uh, but he died only two years after their marriage. And that left Jaquetta a very wealthy widow and a very important political um, player, really. So she gets recalled to England because the couple had been in France at the time. And she's told that she can have all of her lands and her income as long as she doesn't marry without the king's consent, because she's a royal bride now. So she's very important. However, she completely goes against this. And the following year, uh, she marries in secret a knight called Wich Richard Woodville. And again, this is a huge scandal. It's even more of a scandal than Humphrey and Eleanor's marriage because it's accepted that a man might marry a woman of a lower class. That doesn't affect him too much. But for a woman to marry a man of a lower class is a huge social taboo because her status comes from her husband. So the fact that she is a woman who was so high and noble that she could marry a Prince of England has now married a lowly knight is a really, really bad move for her. And Henry is really angry and she, he, he confiscates all of her goods because of this. And it's only about a year later that he's, he sort of agrees to give her her things back, but she has to pay a huge fine. However, the couple have a very happy marriage together. Again, another love marriage. Um, and they actually ended up having 14 children in total. Um, and one of these children was Elizabeth Woodville. So she was born about 1437, probably their first child. And she marries sort of uh, a few years later to this man, John Gray, um, who again is a more lower class man, sort of again, the sort of knightly baronial class because she's taken her status from her father rather than from her much higher status mother. So they have two children together, um, but this is just at the time that the Wars of the Roses is sort of breaking out. Um, and her husband dies uh, during one of these battles in 1460. Now the family had been on the Lancastrian side, uh, the sort of Red Rose side of the war. They'd supported Henry VI and his wife. Um, but after they get ousted from the country and a new king takes over, Edward IV, they change their allegiance to him so that they can stay in the country and live their lives. Now, scandalously, a few years later, it comes out that Edward IV has married Elizabeth Woodville. Now, if we thought that Richard and Jacquetta's marriage was scandalous, this was on another level again. Uh, for the king to firstly marry someone from his own kingdom, this was the first English-born queen for three centuries. Uh, so that's initially scandalous, that she was a widow, that she already had children, that she was older than him, all went against the sort of accepted thing of a queen being young, a virgin, a foreign bride. Um, and she is much, much lower status than him. And so all of these reasons are really scandalous. Um, but just like Jaquetta and Richard, they overcame it and she became a very successful queen. 
about a few years after their marriage, there's a big rebellion in the kingdom by the Earl of Warwick, who was the king's cousin, and the Duke of Clarence, who was the king's brother. And the Earl of Warwick had been holding lots of power whilst Edward had been king. He had helped make him king and he was helping to sort of rule affairs whilst Edward was off keeping control of the kingdom and fighting sort of small rebellions. Um, but by this time, the kingdom had become a lot more secure. Edward was taking control of affairs himself and he was listening to Warwick a lot less. And Warwick didn't like this. And Warwick believed that it was all down to the Woodville family uh, because Elizabeth had so many siblings who had all come to court. Um, he was competing for influence with them and he decided that they were the sort of ones stopping him from having this. Um, so he, they rebel against Edward and they actually managed to capture him. So he's held in imprisonment at Warwick Castle for a while. And during this time, Warwick takes his chance to get rid of the Woodvilles. Um, so Richard Woodville, Jaquetta's husband, is executed alongside one of their sons, John. And then he turns to Jaquetta. So the executions against Richard and John seem to be sort of quite in haste and they weren't legal. And I think Warwick starts to worry about what he's done here and he needs to justify it. And so coming after Jaquetta is a way to show just how evil the Woodfields were, thus justifying these executions. So one of his squires, a man called Thomas Wake, makes an accusation against her, um, saying that these figurines have been found um, that show that she's been doing witchcraft against the king and the queen and possibly even against Warwick himself. So now Jaquetta is arrested. She's also brought to Warwick Castle. And the king is forced to launch an investigation against her because he's powerless to do otherwise. Now, whilst this investigation is going on, Edward is actually released by Warwick because the kingdom is in so much chaos from not having a king keeping them in line that everyone is just descending into fighting each other. Everything is falling apart. So Warwick has to let Edward go. So Edward gets control of the kingdom again, and this means he's then able to help influence the investigation. And when the charges are looked into, it's found that they're completely fabricated. Uh, John uh, Thomas Wake had said that this other man would testify to say that he found the figurines and that it was Jaquetta. But when they bring this man in, he says, I've never heard anything about it to do with Jaquetta. These were left behind by some soldiers. And in fact, Thomas Wake told me to say that it was Jaquetta, but I'm not. Um, and so suddenly it's very clear that these accusations have been completely made up. And so Jaquetta is sort of set free and she's shown to be innocent. Um, but you can see that Jaquetta has really learnt um, from the case against Eleanor, which she would have seen firsthand. She knows how dangerous these accusations can be. And so the following year on the Parliament rolls, there's a record that says about her innocence and it even says that they're writing it down at the insistence of Jaquetta to be preserved for posterity. So here's a real sort of rare insight of a woman's voice in a parliamentary record. She's making sure that everyone knows that they were made up just to hurt her name and she didn't do it. Now she's doing this to try and sort of protect herself in the future against accusations. But unfortunately, this doesn't quite work because the accusations has come back a few decades later against Elizabeth Woodville. So in 1483, Edward IV dies suddenly and his son, who's just a young teenager, becomes king. However, a whole lot of political mess happens and basically his uncle, Prince Richard, seizes him and has himself declared King Richard II instead. And uh, King Edward V and his brother, Richard, uh, sort of mysteriously disappear from the Tower of London. So they're known as the princes in the tower. Um, so Richard's proclaimed himself king, um, but it's decided that he needs to sort of come up with an official reason um, as to why he's king. And the easiest reason for him to be king instead of Elizabeth's children is if the children were illegitimate. Um, so I've just realized that date there is wrong. It's January 1484, not 83, but January 18, uh, 1484, Parliament uh, issues this titulus regius, and it's basically a list of reasons uh, why Richard should be king and instead of um, Elizabeth's children. And there's a whole list of reasons as to why the marriage was invalid. But interestingly, one of the reasons listed is that Elizabeth and Edward's marriage was caused by sorcery and witchcraft committed by the said Elizabeth and her mother, Jaquetta, Duchess of Bedford, 
as the common opinion of the people. So this is really interesting that these accusations against Jaquetta from about 14, 15 years beforehand have stayed around and they're now able to use them um, as, as ammunition against Elizabeth. Um, and what's also interesting is the fact that it says as the common opinion of the people. So he's basically saying everybody in the kingdom knows that they did magic. Um, and he doesn't, again, doesn't really try to bring any proper evidence for this. You know, he says, if evidence is needed, at some point we'll provide it for you. Um, but he doesn't need to make a big deal out of it. You know, he is the one with power. Elizabeth is hiding in sanctuary. Her sons are missing, presumed dead. He's already been king for quite a few months. This is just a formality rather than a proper trial against Elizabeth. So no convincing accusations need to be made. So um, basically a couple of years later, Richard the, uh, Richard III is killed in battle um, by Henry Tudor at the Battle of Bosworth and he takes over the throne and he's sort of gathered a load of followers that used to follow Elizabeth Woodville and her husband by saying if you make me king then I will marry Elizabeth's oldest daughter and we'll unite the different strands and we'll have a really strong monarchy. Um, so he needs to make the children legitimate again so that he can marry her and so he overturns all of this legislation um, that Richard had passed, uh, which then basically gets rid of the accusations against Elizabeth. Um, and again, she lives out the rest of her life um, without any sort of negative effects um, from these accusations, a bit like Joan at the start of the century. So some really different cases there, some very different types of accusations with common threads of sort of treason and love magic um, and how that can affect the legitimacy of a marriage and very different outcomes. You know, some of them are purely political and they're not affected too much, but some of them have had really serious consequences. Um, and so it's quite an interesting sort of collection there. Um, so with just the last sort of couple of minutes before we finish, um, I just did this very brief slide about sort of sources from medieval women, um, which is just an example of some of the sources that I used um, in my book as a way that shows how you can find women in medieval records. Um, obviously this is a bit more skewed towards sort of royal and noble women as that was the sort of line of my research. Um, but a lot of lower class and sort of more common uh, working class women can be found in these records as well. Um, so although it is more difficult to find women than men in medieval records due to the nature of those that survived, um, they are hiding there. So chronicles, if they're a very important woman, if they're a queen, or if something scandalous has happened against them, like with Eleanor, her trial is in all of the chronicles, you can find them there. You can find them in parliamentary records. So the accusations against Joan and Jaquetta were recorded in parliament. You've got sort of a variety of books. So account books, if you've got household accounts that survive of different nobles, uh, the women might be found in there. Um, you've got the sort of inquisitions post-mortem. So when people die, um, there's sort of, inquisitions into all of the land that they own and they'll say who who their heirs are which can include their widows or their daughters um, they might also be renting out land from them um, there's actually a whole heap of sort of government records where they might be found so um, sort of all of the governmental calendars where the king is giving land or jewels to people they might be recipients of that um, and that sort of links in with the issues of the exchequer you've got diplomatic papers particularly for women at court um, all of the sort of diplomats foreign diplomats were writing home and they'll be writing about these women in it elizabeth turns up quite a lot in these diplomatic papers um, letters, particularly as you get into the later medieval period, lots of letters survive. So you've got the Paston letters, which are really important in the 15th century, um, and they're written by women to women, and they feature lots of women within them. Um, songs and ballads and poems are a really interesting one. There's um, a ballad called The Lament of the Duchess of Gloucester, all about Eleanor's downfall. That's a really useful source because it was composed around the time of her trial. So it's a really rare insight into what people at the time were thinking and believing about the trial. Um, and then you've got sort of normal things, petitions, deeds, wills, um, literature. Uh, you know, you've got sort of handbooks coming out at this time about how women are expected to behave. So you have people like Christine de Pizan, who's writing books for princesses and noble women saying, this is how you be a good noble woman. This is how you should act and behave. And that can give you a really good sort of general idea about women at the time. 
Um, so just a brief list there for sort of people who are interested. Um, but we are out of time now. It's, it's eight o'clock. So thank you all for listening. Um, I've put some of my details on the screen there if you do want to find me. Uh, my email address is there if you have any sort of questions after the seminar. Um, and there's actually a new edition of my book coming out in just a few days with a fancy new cover. Um, so do take a look if you want to learn a bit more um, about the woman in the book. Um, but yes, thank you all very much. Um, thank you so so much. That was that was so interesting. Um, I mean, I got I got loads of ideas from that. So I've already thought of kind of inquiry questions and things we might ask. What might royal witches reveal, for example, about medieval England or life for women in medieval England, or or maybe we could ask um, why have people said different things at different times um, about Eleanor Eleanor of Cobham, for example. So I think lots of of things there for history teachers um, to think about. Um, I'm just going to share my screen again. Can you all see that? Mm -hmm. Great. Um, so yeah, as I said at the start of the webinar, please feel free to go and have a look. Scan the QR codes are on the screen that take you to various things, including a link to, to Gemma's book um, where you can purchase it. Tweet about us, Twitter handles there on, on the left. Um, and please feel free to, to, have the, to answer some of those questions as well in the, in the chat. And also start typing your questions now in the Q&A. So, so lots going in, I can see already. So that's great. Um, we'll get to those in a few moments. And, and Janice is going to ask, my colleague from Be World History is going to ask the questions uh, from the Q&A. Um, but I've just got a few just while we're waiting for those, those questions to come in. I couldn't help thinking, and this might be a bit tongue in cheek, perhaps, but especially in the case of... Um, Eleanor of Cobham, but I guess also to a degree with the others. When, when she's kind of walking through the city of London as part of her penance, um, I can't help feeling it kind of evokes images, pictures, ideas of, you know, the, the aldermen of the city, the, the guild members, the peasantry alike, chucking wrong cabbages and jeering at her, etc. Would that have happened? Is that something that, that might have, you know, might have occurred? And I guess also how well known was her trial among everyday people? Across yeah, so obviously people could very well have sort of jeered and, and things like that. As you say, the, the punishment was very much intended to, um, to humiliate her. You know, that's the whole point of it. As I said, this is not a punishment that any other noble woman would have done. It was normally reserved for lower class women who'd been adulteresses. Um, and so that's why it's meant to be so humiliating because everybody in the parish is meant to know she's a bad woman, she's done something terrible. Um, so the whole nature of it, you know, the fact is she was walking on foot um, and no woman of her class would walk through any town on foot. She would always be in a carriage or on horseback. So just the fact that she is walking on foot shows that she has fallen, she is a fallen woman, she's done something terrible, she's wearing simple clothes, she's just wearing a slip, you know, she doesn't have her very elegant gowns on showing off her status, you know, at this period, clothes are a real marker of what status you are, so not having all of her clothes and her jewels, again, is a really visual thing for everybody to see she's done something really bad, so it's definitely meant to humiliate her, and the fact that it's on busy market days in London, you know, the, one of the big, busiest cities in the country, the idea is that the word is meant to spread that she's done this. Um, there very well, well may have been people who sort of might have jeered at her. Um, but actually what's quite interesting is there does seem to be quite a bit of sympathy for Eleanor. So although a lot of the chronicles sort of a very gossipy about the accusations against her. And as I said, maybe suggest that she deserved it to an extent. Um, there's other evidence I sort of found after her trial that suggests that people not necessarily didn't believe that she had done it, but didn't believe that she should be punished in this way. Um, so you actually have a few years after her trial, Henry VI is going through Greenwich, which is where Eleanor and Humphrey had their own palace in Greenwich and it was like their main home there. And this woman, this common woman, goes up to Henry VI and starts yelling at him and says, you should have Eleanor home to her husband. You've treated her terribly. 
And this is so shocking for Henry that this poor woman actually gets executed for this um, because she's affronted the king in this way. But, you know, the fact that a woman was willing to go up to the king and say, get Eleanor home, you've treated her terribly, you know, suggests that even if people think that she had been involved in witchcraft, that they didn't necessarily think she should be punished in this way. And this is partly because of how popular Humphrey was. Everybody in the kingdom loved him, which was part of the problem of his enemies. How do we get rid of this guy who is of royal blood and everybody likes? What can we do? Um, and even accused using his wife of treason doesn't seem to be enough. People still love him. Um, so yeah, again, that, that kind of then maybe suggests that maybe people weren't too cruel to her when she was doing her penance. You know, maybe people were actually very sympathetic and going, oh my goodness, what's happened to this woman kind of thing. Sorry, I was stuck on mute. Um, yeah, I mean, these are such unbelievably good stories and, and strikes me they'd be so good in the history classroom. Um, there's lots of questions coming in, in the Q&A, so I don't want to hog it. Um, Janice, shall we go Shall we go to the Q&A? And I think there's been a few questions in the chat as well. Yeah, yeah, I just want to start by saying thank you, Gemma. It was a really, really interesting talk. So thank you for sharing with us. Um, the first question is from Hannah. Um, she wonders whether the majority of witchcraft ac accusations in the medieval period um, focused on higher status women or whether it's seen lower down in the sort of social ladder. Yeah, so um, accusations of witchcraft in the medieval period, particularly in England, are quite few and far between. Um, we actually sort of lag behind the continent a bit. Um, so the previous century on the continent, particularly in France and even at the papal court, there had been some cases of political accusations of witchcraft, but they only sort of make it this following century with these women. Um, but you do have a few sort of occasional cases of them. Um, most of them don't get too serious, um, but most of them are against men uh, rather than women. And that's partially because of what I was saying at the start about the types of magic that it was believed people could wield. It was just thought that men were the ones who could deal harmful magic and harmful magic was the only thing that people were really too concerned about. Um, they're not too concerned certainly at the start of the period, a bit more towards the end of the period, but they're not too concerned by a woman in a village who might be selling some charms. You know, they, they don't really care about that. And, you know, even if they do start to care a bit, as I said, it's a matter for the church. And they tended to have a word from the local priest saying, just stop doing that and we'll turn a blind eye kind of thing. Um, so it is a lot more of a rarity. So certainly the cases against these women are sort of really big and sudden and shocking um and as i said you do get a couple of other ones but they're normally sort of lower down priests from some sort of church somewhere who've been caught up doing something a bit naughty and sort of get accused um certainly in england so yeah this is essentially where those accusations really start to pick up in england that's brilliant. Um, that actually links into to a second question, um, which is how and why did the focus of witchcraft shift towards ordinary women um, by the 17th century? Yeah, so it's 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 kind of from external influences, really. Um, I think par partly the fact that you have these four high status cases against women in England certainly brings to people's attention that women can be involved in witchcraft. But it's more ideas imported from abroad, I think, really, you know, I mentioned the Malleus Maleficarum, so that was very much someone saying it's mostly women who do that, and that sort of slowly gets brought over as you go into the Tudor period. Um, you also have a lot of influence coming over from Scotland. Um, Scotland were much more into the witchcraft trials than, than England, um, sort of towards the end of the 16th century, going into the 17th century um, under King James VI. Um, and he sort of really pushes for these big witchcraft trials that involve lots of people and tend to involve lower class people with a few upper class people sprinkled in but it's much more of the sort of witchcraft trials we recognize where it's a group of people in a village who have all been doing these kinds of things and so when he comes to the throne in England these ideas get imported um, and again that kind of brings in this idea that lower class people can do it um, and you know you've had a century or so of time for it to change so it's not this idea anymore that only really clever can, people can do it it's the idea that if you make a pact with the devil then you have access to magic and anybody can make a pact with the devil and in fact it's probably more likely to be lower class people because they're going to be more misguided they're not as educated so they don't know necessarily not to do that um, so that's where you do start to get that shift but yeah it is a bit of a gradual shift um, and actually in reality a lot of men 
men were still accused of witchcraft. Um, but yeah, certainly in England, you do get a bit more of a bias towards women than men uh, once you go into the early modern period. I see. Okay, it's brilliant. Um, just a couple more questions for you, if if if, if I may. Um, so Danielle was wondering um, whether the rumours um, of Wood, uh, Wood can speak Woodville um, continues after her marriage um, to um, Henry the Seventh. Oh, Sorry, right. after Elizabeth of York's marriage to Henry the Seventh. So, um, yes and no. You don't really see it um, sort of in the official record. Um, it's never sort of brought up um, as a slur against Elizabeth or her daughter Elizabeth. Um, but the rumours certainly still um, circulated in some format um, because some of the sources that I used were um, one of the Tudor Chronicles um, that is quite an important source but is also um, full of Tudor propaganda. And um, in this chronicle, written decades after this happened, and they're talking about Richard III, um, they're, they're basically um, talking about the accusations that he makes against Elizabeth. And they make up this scene where there's this council meeting where um, Hastings, who's a very important lord, got arrested. And they're talking about his arrest. And within this, they say, um, about how Richard III had accused Elizabeth um, and actually one of Edward's mistresses as well, saying that they'd used witchcraft against him. Um, and you get some of that Tudor propaganda. Um, the Tudor period, they say that uh, Richard had a withered arm, which now that we've found his skeleton, uh, we can confirm that that wasn't true. And it was just Tudor propaganda sort of, you know, as a way of sort of showing physical deformity, linking with an evil personality. Um, but there's a story about how at this meeting he says, look, Elizabeth's a witch. She's withered my arm. And he sort of says, oh, everybody at the meeting scoffed because they knew his arm had always been withered. So Elizabeth can't have done it. But, you know, this is decades afterwards and there's still this idea of, yes, Richard accused Elizabeth of witchcraft, even though they're saying it was nonsense, it's still there. So the stories have definitely continued onwards um, to an extent. But, yeah, the, the women themselves probably weren't really too harmed by it anymore. Um, thank you for that. Um, last question comes from Tina. Um, she's asked about alchemy and sort of relationship between science and magic. Um, so if you could just sort of elaborate at all on, on, on that kind of relationship, that would be great. Yeah, so I sort of, I, I briefly mentioned it at the start. Um, as you say, it's, it's another instance of where you really get those blurred lines between science and magic. So alchemy was very much viewed as a scientific endeavor. So um, the Duke of Bedford, who Jaquetta marries first, in the early 1430s, he's actually paying people, he's paying alchemists to try and figure out a way to make gold um, because the English crown was still broke. You know, the reason that they accused Joan was they had no money for the wars in France. And here they are 10, 15 years later, still at war with France. So they still need that money and he has no money to pay his troops. So he's paying people to say, find a way to make us some gold out of something else. And then I can use that gold to pay my troops. So, you know, he's the Prince of England paying alchemists. So that kind of shows that it really has this kind of scientific idea. Um, and, you know, it's not necessarily too far fetched. You know, we kind of think of it being a bit silly, like, oh, how can you turn something into gold? But, you know, if you think of sort of some various chemical reactions, you combine one element with another and it can produce something very different. And so, you know, to their minds, well, why can't we try and figure out a way to do something to lead that will make it become gold? Um, so, yeah, it's viewed very much scientifically. And I think it's something that more that we look back on it as something magical, um, but it could certainly blur the line still like with astrology people might experiment a bit too far and merge over the lines into magic, you know, they might try and start using magic to bring it about rather than science. Um, so yeah, there's there's always the possibility with sort of scientific endeavors at this time that it can cross over into witchcraft. Brilliant. Thank you so much for answering those questions, um, Gemma, and thank you again for a, an excellent talk. Yeah, I think I'd just echo Janice there and, and, and say that, that that was absolutely fantastic. So, so thank you so, so much. Um, what a great collection of stories is all I would say, um, and I think they'd be fantastic in the history classroom. And thank you so much for sharing, sharing those sources as well. I think that's so useful for us as, as history teachers.
Um, last couple of bits to say, just as we start to bring things to a close, um, a recording of this will go up on our YouTube channel, along with all of the recordings from all of the webinars um, we've ever done. Apologies for me, there are a few that I still need to edit and fire up. I am a teacher as well, and I'm very, very busy, as we all are at the moment, um, but they will be up there eventually. With that in mind, um, a talk actually went up this week. It went up a couple of days ago um, where I, uh, a few, about a year ago, actually, had a very long conversation um, with a historian in Australia called Dr. James Boyce. And we've recorded or turned it into three videos um, about colonial Australia. And the first of those about the settlement of Australia went live on our YouTube channel uh, about two or three days ago. Um, and I really, really encourage anyone who wants to teach more about the empire to go up and watch those. It was an absolute education for me. Uh, and, and I've already gone off the back off the back of it, gone and changed so much of, of what we teach at my school, Boulder Academy around empire. So go up on YouTube and have a look at the talk with Dr. James Boyce. And then just a couple of other reminders. Um, so I hope lots of you already have, have signed up to our talk which is coming up on the 16th of November with none other than Ben Walsh, um, who I'm sure anyone who's a history teacher on here would already know all about. Um, unfortunately, the tickets as they stand have sold out, but keep this under your hats, but some insider knowledge as you're on this webinar, uh, a week before that webinar, which is on the 16th of March, we're gonna do a special release of 50 more tickets. So keep an eye on our Twitter, at Bebold History for information about that. You might like to subscribe to our event by Eventbrite page and you can just follow the links which are on the side. Um, but yeah, watch out for the special release if you didn't get a ticket first time. That will come a week before the event approximately. Um, and that's it really. In the meantime, if you want to interact with us, please do get onto Twitter. We'd actually really like to hear who you want to hear from next. So what historians do you want to um, have a webinar from? So tweet us using our handle at Bebold History. What historians do you want to hear from next? But otherwise, all that's left for me to say is thank you so, so much for everybody for being here tonight and for supporting the network. And obviously it goes without saying, one final massive thank you to Gemma. I thought that was an absolute tour de force and so fascinating. So thanks so much. Oh, well, thank you very much for having me and for all of your interesting questions. And, and as I said, if anyone comes up with any other questions later, I'm more than happy to answer them. You can message me on social media or via my email or anything. So yeah. <laughs> Fantastic. Thank you so much.